This is Ken Pyle. We're on the show floor of the MTA, and we're with Jim Beatty of, uh, of BevCom. Jim, you were a moderator of a panel on video programming access the other day. So yes. why don't you give us a highlight from that panel? Well, uh, we talked about a lot of things and in a very short period of time. But I guess one thing I'd like to talk about is uh, one of the major concerns for small cable and video providers and MTA members who are in the video business is uh, the dramatically increasing price of sports programming, either through the national networks such as ESPN, uh, through national broadcasting networks who have uh, uh, bid and won uh, broadcast rights for sports leagues, the NCAA, whatever, and then um, uh, regional sports networks. And um, you know some of the some of the some of the, the amounts of money that are being tossed around for broadcast rights is starting to be almost mind-bogglingly ridiculous, and the leagues use or the, kind of the model is you know when when Albert Pujols gets paid thirty-five million dollars a year on a contract by the Los Angeles Angels, the Los Angeles Angels know that they're going to get that money from their regional sports network that they sold their broadcast rights to and the regional sports network knows that they can get that from a cable or satellite provider who then passes that cost down to the consumer and at what point does it get that the consumer just says I can't pay this anymore and that does that doesn't do anybody any good it doesn't do us as providers any good and it doesn't do the the network any good because they lose subscription fees. So it's part of the panel is, you know, what can be done about that? And there's been discussions about well is 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 the time ripe for a uh, sports programming tier. And perhaps not yet, I guess is the answer. So um, Well that uh, didn't Tom Cohen mention something about uh, adding a fee or something, uh, the way you know some of the large satellite providers well, satellite providers have been adding a sports programming fee yeah. or surcharge uh, to the bills to their companies. I'm not sure if that fixes the problem. Right. Um, I think what it does is it may it may indicate to the consumer that perhaps sports programming is a major driving force in why their rates are going up mm -hmm. significantly every year. And, and maybe it's kind of a backdoor way of putting uh, pressure on either Congress or the FCC to deal with uh, rising rates, uh, in particular sports programming rates. Well, and it's interesting, too, it, it'll be interesting to see if the people who really aren't that thrilled about having sports programming just cut the cord entirely and, you know, use other services over the top. Right, right. And I think, well, I think, you know, it's like, um, I think it's pretty clear that perhaps 80 percent, 70 to 80 percent of our customers may never watch any sports at all on television. The problem is you've got that 20 to 30 percent of people who do watch it of which maybe 10 to 15 percent are avid sports fans right. and they'll pay whatever to get access to that content. Uh, the problem is the people who don't ever watch it are subsidizing those who do. Mm -hmm. So the, the problem is how do, you, how do you do that? And it may come to a point where those who don't watch it, if it gets too expensive, say, you know what, I'll either go over the top or I will, if they're in an area where they can get broadcast television free over the air, they'll just say, you know, a lot of people still, even though there are all these networks out there, most people in prime time are watching the big four broadcast networks. Right. And so, they say, you know, our viewing habits are we watch broadcast television in prime time, we can get that free over the air, and then we can either, the other programming we, we watch on occasion, we can either get through a Hulu box or or you can watch a whole series if we have a Netflix um, subscription. So there may be ways around it where they might just say, we'll go free over the air, 
and whatever we can get over the air we'll watch and the rest of it we'll try to get over the top. And I can imagine then you know eventually if that happens in significant numbers then the price per, per subscriber for the programming will go up even higher for well, the sports. I think, I think it's kind of a it's it's the, the problem is is that the, the networks have paid a lot of money right. for these broadcast rights and if they're not getting the subscriptions yeah. to help pay for that, they won't be able to meet their financial obligations to the sports leagues or the teams to pay for it. So it's kind of like, is it the, is it the next housing bubble? Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a sports, sports bubble, bubble. Yeah. that may occur sometime down the road and that people will just say, we can't afford to pay it anymore. And then it's a house of cards that starts to, to fall. Right. So you know, I, think, I think it behooves both um, satellite and cable providers and telcos that are in the business and networks to see if there's some sort of solution to this problem. Uh, and the thing that kind of gets me a little bit is it just seems to go further and further down in the in the chain, uh, you know, to the college, to the high school, where, you know, people are buying programming rights and so forth, and it's good, I mean, to, to support these things, but at the same time, it becomes uh, very much about monetizing, uh, especially when you get to the amateur level, monetizing things that are supposed to be for fun, right? Well, and I think, you know, that You've seen a lot of shift in college conferences of late, and that's driven by money and by broadcast rights. And, you know, I think, you know, we're here in Big Ten country, right. and next year, the University of Maryland and Rutgers University are joining the Big Ten. They did, they did so only because of the, of the money they thought that they could get as being part of the Big Ten network uh, contract. And I think if you're a University of Maryland fan, and you now find out that your, your, your ancient rivalries that you've had in that conference for years with North Carolina and Duke and Virginia, they go away. Mm -hmm. And now, now your rivals are, you don't have rivals anymore. You've never had a rivalry with Ohio State or Michigan uh, or Penn State. It's like, it's only for money. And I think some of the alumni in some of these schools are saying, why are we doing this? Yeah. So what, what's the point? Yeah, what's the point? So you know, we, what do you mean we don't get to play Duke twice a year in basketball anymore? That's what we live for, right. and now we won't play Duke twice a year or three times a year. And so I, I don't know what the answer is, but it may be, like I say, there may be a sports bubble uh, looming on the horizon. Well, Jim, on that note, I think that's a, a good way to summarize it, and uh, appreciate your time as always. Thank you. Thank you. Yep.